So I teach Spanish here, and for some reason, the slides, it's you know better. Well, we'll just go like this. So I am going to talk about two things. I'll add two flowers to the bouquet. One is, what do you do when you go on a trip? You come back and you have all this stuff that you want to incorporate to your classes. I'm going to talk about the beginning processes of how do you infuse all these experiences into a course that already has a packed full curriculum. Like Takako was talking about, when we teach a language, we've got all kinds of vocabulary and verbs and grammar to teach. And there's, there's not always a whole lot of just space to spend a whole class lecturing about the, the Arabic influences on the language and culture. So my challenge was, how do I incorporate that, yet still teach what I'm supposed to teach? Um, so I, I went on a CIE trip to Spain and Morocco. And as a Spanish teacher, I wanted to find a way to go beyond mariachis and flamenco when we teach Spanish. I wanted really <laughs> students to, to think about the other, the other influences that, that have impacted the Spanish language and cultures. So, this is my beginning list of how I'm in that process. It's a long process and I'm not finished, but I want to talk about four things that I'm doing in my classes and then I'll quickly go through these because I also want to talk about the service learning project that sort of bubbled out of this. Um, so here we go. So this is in a 103 class. One of the vocabulary units that we teach is food. So we teach food vocabulary, but I'm doing it now in the context of as we learn this vocabulary, where do these foods come from? What's the origin of these foods? So we talk about vocabulary, and then we, we look at foods that are indigenous in origin, that come from Nahuatl and um, Quechua languages, and words in Spanish that are direct Arabic words, or have direct, um, or, or directly descended from, from Arabic words, like alcachofa, almundias, almendras. So we talk about that, and so we're still learning the vocabulary, but we're doing it in the context of, of what I really want to get at in this course. Uh, sandia, you go back. Sandia? Sand is a food? No, uh, watermelon. <laughs> so, and then that leads, it, so it leads this, the students to think <laughs> about what are some of the other influences? They start to see patterns linguistically, which is another thing that grammatically I want to teach them to look at patterns in the language. So then we do this and we talk about, look at all these other words, they all begin with A, why is that? They all begin with A-L, and then we talk about how there are 4,000 words in the Spanish language that are Arabic words, or come directly from Arabic. And then that leads us into an interesting conversation about what do these vocabulary items have in common? What other influences, oh, sorry, I guess I put that part up. What are some of the other Arabic influences in Spain? So this is just an example of how I was able to teach what I'm supposed to teach, but put it in the context of, of um, my CIE trip. With my second year students, they have more language proficiency, so we can actually, I, I can lecture at them for maybe 10 minutes and they'll, they'll be able to follow me. So in second year, we focus on past tense verbs. There's, there's a, those of you who've studied Spanish, there, there are two past tenses and it's hard to, to manipulate them and figure out which is which. So oftentimes when language teachers teach verbs, we talk about, what did you do this weekend? Well, what did you do? What did your mother do this weekend? So I decided, well, let's talk about what did Christopher Columbus do when he came, and what did Abdraman do when he came to Spain? And so instead of, again, narration is, is what I'm trying to teach them, but I chose to teach the narration in the, in the context of um, how the Arabic influence got to the, the peninsula. That's one example. Then in 202, we're teaching comparative superlative structures. So instead of comparing, you know, is your mother taller than your father, or um, <laughs> is Bob taller than John, choose something else to, to compare it to. So this is just another example of how, again, I, I have to teach these grammatical structures, but we can do it in the context of, of something that's cultural and something that gets at some of the deeper ideas. Um, 203, when I was in my trip in, in Spain and Morocco, we talked a lot about immigration issues from Africa to Spain right across the Strait of Gibraltar, and obviously there are lots and lots and lots of similarities between the Mexican-American border. So a lot of times, even in Spanish classes, immigration is a sensitive issue. The Mexican-American border is a touchy subject for a lot of people. So it's, it's interesting to look at it in a context that's not so personal for a lot of the students. So we look at patterns of immigration and then can see the, how that affects the Mexican immigration. Um, I'm going to flip through the intangibles pretty quickly because I want to talk about the service learning project and move on. So while I was there, I, I've 
done a significant amount of travel, but it's always been in places where I speak the language. So this was the first time in a long, long time that I couldn't speak the language. I was back at that level of trying to buy a pair of shoes, and I don't even have a way to put my, my six words together. And so it really just gave me a lot of empathy for my students, reminded me the importance of me teaching language learning strategies to my students, um, how it's such an intriguing aspect, motivational, also personal connections that are, that are formed. And so a lot of these are intangibles that, sure, they didn't, they're not something I'm doing exactly in my class, but they inform my teaching every single day. And I think we should also recognize when we go on a trip, those sorts of intangibles are also important. So this is what prompted me to have the service learning project bubble up. Um, by spending time with these host families, I really wanted to learn more Arabic so I could talk to them. And that personal connection was huge. So when I came back, I worked with a colleague in the ESOL tutoring, or the, the ESOL program. And we found a way to get my students into the ESOL classroom and work directly with these students, most of whom are native Spanish speakers, although there are definitely students from all over. Um, so this is something that's happening now, also a bit of a result of, of this trip, and it's a great success. We have students from writing and Spanish classes, and they're spending an hour a week with two students who are immigrants and refugees. They're getting to know each other. They're talking about their families, their favorite foods, because the ESOL students are building up vocabulary and practicing narration and conversation. But it's about a topic that I want my Spanish students to learn about, you know, what's life like for my, for my new friend Maria in Guatemala, and the writing 121, 115, and 90 students are learning about um, the students as well. So who are the students in ESOL? What happens during the tutoring? It's, we can talk more about this as if, you, if anyone has questions. I know I have limited time. Um, one of the, the most beautiful things is the intercultural connections that's happening. As the writing 121, 150, 90 students and my Spanish students are going in and being surrounded with 30 students from all over the world and getting to know them, developing a relationship and a friendship. That's, that's made a big difference. And I think that's it. Here's a couple of photos. If anybody wants to participate right now, we have um, an instructor in writing 90, writing 115 and writing 121 who are sending their students to the service learning projects. And we're always looking for more. So if you teach a class and you think this might be a good fit for your students, send them on over.